one of the games I like playing is the five levels of why. Oh yeah. Which come, which kind of comes out of, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit silly and it's, uh, I would, <laughs> it's a little bit silly. We'll put it that way. By the uh, third it one, it's like, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah. By the third <laughs> one, you, but you've probably got your answer, right? Yeah. And it's, it's a little bit silly, but you know, kind of go down that rabbit hole. The, f- the first thing that you always want is a native integration between two apps. A great example now is like QuickBooks and MailChimp. Hey, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Of course. So uh, tell us a little bit about you and your company. I know that uh, our folks just listened to the intro about you, but in your own words, what do you do at Better Way CPA? Sure. So we offer virtual CFO services to marketing and creative agencies primarily. We're also branching out into nonprofits. Been doing this for about 11 years. Uh, started as a side hustle full time, four years. Just had my four year birthday like two days ago. So that's exciting. Uh, we are a team of seven, international team. We're scattered all throughout the US. And then we've also got a staff member in the Philippines. And that's pretty much what we do. Awesome. And uh, what we were talking about before we hit record, what we're actually going to be talking about today, uh, even though we could talk all day on tax strategy issues and questions and, mm-hmm. and numbers, we're actually going to talk more about processes because I think that's kind of the backbone of, as we said, like the podcast is called Keep What You Earn, right? The best way to do that is have systems in place to hold on to that money and to be efficient, right? So we're going to dive into a little bit more around some of the operations, but also how it can save you a bit of money even though it feels like, you know, for those of you listening, especially online, online coaches, service providers, feels like all your money is going out in subscriptions, right? So let's talk about how to optimize how we use technology and how we use our processes. So Chris, what tips do you have for our audience that you use with your clients? Well, when we're talking about automation, first thing we usually ask is what are the things that are annoying to you and your business? And then let's automate that. So when we automate things, uh, number one, it creates some capacity inside of your business. So it's taking, you're, it's freeing up either your time or it's freeing up a staff member's time or something like that, or it's making it so that you can delay hiring another person. And then so that's number one. And then number two is it puts guardrails around quality. So this, whatever automation it is that you put in place, it's going to do the same thing over and over again, so that you're going to get relatively the same output. So it's quality, and then it's also freeing up capacity. So that's the first place that we start. What are the most annoying things in your business? How can we free up some capacity for you to do something else with your time? And then number two, how do we put quality around whatever it is that you do, whether it's communication or your actual output, you know, communication to clients, things like that. Perfect. And uh, do you get any any resistance to automation or uh, folks who say, well, like I just do it my way or like heavily judgment-based processes? How do you navigate that? Yeah, we get that. All the time, especially when when things are project based, Um, we get that a lot around video shoots. So we work with marketing creative agencies when there's video shoots where you're trying to assign different expenses to project codes, things like that. Yes, we definitely do get some some pushback. You know, the way to kind of think about that, number one, is just information flow. How do you structure the inf- information flow inside of your business? What are the various apps and processes that you can put in place and then make sure that they're connected so you can get some sort of a workaround? Not everything can be automated. You know, that's why you want to look at the things that are, you know, the biggest pain points that you have at the moment and then explore it, right? Not everything, you know, not everything's automatable for sure, but we get, we do get some pushback around, you know, project type stuff. Uh, as far as just being able to save people time and being able to automate things, generally people are pretty open to it. Yeah. And one of the first places I see people automate and first, one of the first places I did too, was the, like sort of the intake and onboarding process with a new client. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's one of the, I'd say not easier things to implement, but probably one of the most front of mind things that could be automated, just given the amount of administrative tasks involved in that. Do you have any specific tips on implementing a solid automation and onboarding or even any tools or softwares that you recommend for clients? Yeah. Uh, onboarding is an interesting thing because you're not, you, well, there's a potential to not just automate onboarding. You're also automating some client communication around that. You could be potentially automating some accounting functions around that. Here's an example. Uh, let's just say that you have some sort of a form and you could do it with Google Forms. You could do it with something like Formstack. You can do it with something like Typeform or maybe like a Gravity Forms that goes on your WordPress website, something like that. So you're taking a form 
And then there is an automation that happens between that form and your CRM software. <clears throat> so if your CRM software is set up correctly and it uh, integrates with something like a MailChimp, which is your newsletter software, now you've just automated a portion of your CRM and your client communication. Now, if you have an automation that also syncs your CRM platform to your, account, to your accounting platform, now you've uh, automated some segment of your accounting function, right? And the beauty of automating that sort of a workflow is now you've got consistent naming conventions. And the reason why consistent naming conventions are important, and this is a problem that we see when we automate things for clients all the time, especially when we're doing analytics and reporting and things like that, is if you have client ABC on, let's just say your accounting platform, and you're trying to match up revenue with some other non-financial data, and in your CRM, they're client ABC, comma, LLC, those two things are not going to match up. Then you're going to have a data mismatch. You're going to get bad numbers. You're going to make some sort of a bad decision somewhere down the line. It's going to cost you some money. So that's not a good thing. So when we automate the onboarding process, we're looking at good tools, you know, like a form stack, um, like a type form, something like that, where we're looking at CRM, we're looking at, again, good tools, like a HubSpot or Zoho or whatever that's going to be. The way that we connect all of these things would be something like a Zapier or an Integromat, which is called Make Now or Microsoft Flow, um, which is kind of the Microsoft competitor to those two platforms. Those are the big three that we really look at. But there's those things pop up all the time. I just saw a new one yesterday. Can't remember the name of it, but here we are. Yeah, and uh, Zap is the glue holding my business together, I swear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hear you. It's, it's, that's Integromat for me. We use I've used Integromat for a few years, or Make now, I guess is what you would call it. But yeah, um, but yeah same thing. It's the glue holding the business together with all the integrations. Cause I feel like when it comes to finding solutions for particular things, I I'm kind of a fan of uh, going to the company that does what they do best. You know, like I know, for example, QuickBooks online has a payroll function, but mm -hmm. I'm not super impressed by it. So I use Gusto and I trigger the integrations because I'm like, well, Gusto just does payroll. So if they F up payroll, uh, they're out of business. So they have more of a stake in the game to get it right. And I, I like their interface better. So I think what this allows you to do is right. Pick point solutions are the, that are the best of the best, as opposed to trying to cram it all into one, all in one solution, which, which do you kind of prefer or see? Yeah. So I am a best of breed solution person as well. Like I want the best tools for the job. The ones that I know are, are going to work, they're not going to break the like, that's why we use Gusto is because we've had mm -hmm. bad experience with just about every other payroll platform, not Gusto yet, knock on wood. Um, <laughs> so we want best of breed with all of these other tools, but then you run into integration problems. Like the, the first thing that you always want is a native integration between two apps. A great example now is like QuickBooks and MailChimp where QuickBooks went and bought MailChimp, well, into it, bought MailChimp, who owns QuickBooks. And now there's this native integration. So it's great, fine, cool, done. But in... It doesn't happen in every perfect scenario. So you have to stitch these apps together so that you can move data between them. And the way that you do that is with the so-called glue, you know, like a Zapier or an Integromat or something like that. Yeah. And um, so what, give, me, give us some examples of how you've done this with clients, right? Like what processes you've been able to in, um, implement automation for that really move the needle into, in terms of saving time, energy, money? Yeah, best one is invoicing. So I've got an early stage, SaaS company and their invoicing process is very, very manual for a variety of reasons. Part of it is because of just who they're selling to and how they're selling to those folks to kind of get revenue in the door, right? And they're not quite cloud-based yet. So they've got this very manual process. And the way that they were doing it was basically their CRM and their invoicing process is lumped into a Google Sheet. And so you've got this huge Google Sheet with a whole bunch of data that's it's not really going anywhere. And so you're manually putting data into a Google sheet. You're manually putting data into a project management software. You're manually putting um, data into your invoicing platform, which in this case, I think they were on Wave or they're now on QuickBooks, but it doesn't matter. So we built an automation that looks at that Google sheet and then basically loops over it and sends out invoices based on their different parameters twice a month now. So there's that piece. Then they went after that, they, when they Im implemented a project management software. So now we're working on the process of moving that data from the project management software into the sheet. And then we already have the process built to move it from a sheet to an invoice. That's a 
That's a really great example. We've got other examples where we're taking various time data. So uh, in the marketing agency space, uh, I'm sure you can appreciate this. Uh, they're using every manner of time tracking software that there is. There's really no set standard. And it's one of the things that we don't really put our foot down about, but um, moving time data is one of the things that that we do a lot of and aggregating it somewhere so that we can then um, run analytics on it and put it into a dashboard and um, match it up with QuickBooks data and stuff like that. So there's a lot of data movement that we do um, around timesheet data. So those are probably the two best examples. So, I mean, looking at the data, like collecting the data is first and foremost, right? Collecting it into mm -hmm. a structured manner instead of unstructured, uh, you know, common naming conventions, options, things like that. Let's talk about the analysis though, because I think a lot of business owners may, maybe they have these systems in place and they're collecting all this data, but then they're not doing anything with it. I find a lot of business owners are getting like, uh, getting, getting data in through like, let's say a Kajabi or a MailChimp or Dubsado or whatever. And mm -hmm. they're not using that to then create more sequences, more automation or more opportunities. Do you find that too? Like they're just not quite tapping into the full potential? All the time. And part of the problem is the data is everywhere. So it makes it difficult. And then if it's going to be difficult to get to and do analysis on, you're probably just not going to do it, especially if you're a small business owner and you're not terribly interested in that aspect and you haven't had training in that aspect and, you know, having, you know, haven't figured out like exactly how that is going to benefit you, then yeah, you're, that's one of those things that gets missed all the time, which is why it's important to have advisors like you who can go into the business and start kind of poking and prodding and asking questions about the business. So where we usually start with this is it's all about what questions do you want to ask of your business and then get answers back to. And yeah. then we figure out a way to, to get those answers. What are those data points that we need? How do we get at them? How can we move that data between apps or consolidate it somewhere and then plug that into some sort of a data visualization tool, data, data analytics tool, whatever that's going to be. We use Google Data Studio, um, but these, these things are all over the place at this point. You've got Power BI, you've got Tableau, you've got Domo. It's, there's, you know, the list is basically endless at this point. There's a new one every single day, feels like anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I know that a lot of folks say like, I don't have time to analyze all this data and I need tools to be able to do it or someone to help me with it. I think the, like I said, the first step is collecting it. The next step is figuring out what you want to have answered. That also leads into sort of KPIs, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. it's targeting the priorities of what questions you need to answer and what will actually matter because a lot of folks are actually, I find a lot of clients or, or folks that I meet are misdirected and trying to track something where, Oh, I want to know how many people are in my email list. Well, what does that tell you? Because do you know the conversion rate? Do you know the click rate? Do you know what that does for your numbers at the end of the day? Or is that just kind of a qualitative metric, you know, that's measuring something else? It's like mm -hmm. knowing what you're measuring, right? When you're collecting that data. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay, so what, you know, how many users are at this point in your funnel, but what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. and if the answer is nothing, then that's not a good KPI for you to be tracking. It's got to be a question that's that goes beyond interesting. It's got to be a question where, okay, if I had the answer to this, I would be able to do this. And then if I were able to do that, then that would move my business forward. And that's that's kind of the way to, that we think about um, developing KPIs anyway. What types of questions do you ask your business owners when developing the KPIs to get them to kind of unpack what they really are? Like for our listeners who are thinking, I haven't really defined my KPIs yet. What should I be thinking about? It's a, yeah, it's exactly that way. It's like, what questions do you have about the business? And then maybe we'll get answers. Maybe we won't. And then it's like, okay, well, if you had the answers to that, what would you then do? And you basically just go down that rabbit hole. Um, mm -hmm. One of the games I like playing is the five levels of why. Oh yeah. Which come, which kind of comes out of, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit silly and it's, uh, I would, <laughs> it's a little bit silly. We'll put it that way. By the uh, third it one, it's Toyota. like, okay, I get it. <laughs> Yeah. By the third <laughs> one, you, but you've probably got your answer, right? Yeah. And it's, it's a little bit silly, but you know, kind of go down that rabbit hole. It's just going down rabbit holes around what, what questions do you have about the business and then just figuring that out. And then how do we get to that data? Do you have the data in your business right now? No. Okay. Well, what's it going to cost to get that data? And is that, is the benefit of that data or is the benefit of having that data and having that answer going to outweigh the cost of getting that data and the effort that's going to take to move the data from place to place and things like that. But it's basically just going down a rabbit hole. If I had to really distill that answer down. Yeah. And I think, I think there's an underappreciation for what data can tell you, because I think a lot of folks assume that successful business owners just know 
are like, just have an intuition when in reality, you know, every product launch, every major decision, major announcement that you see on say social media is probably predicated on, you know, months and months and months of data collection, data analysis, Mm -hmm. and then the decision to go do that. And then the execution. So I think that there's this kind of tip of the iceberg that we see, but this is all what's underneath. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And like some business owners, like they just got lucky. Yeah. Right. You know, it looks like maybe they didn't have any data. Maybe they just made a good decision. Maybe they got lucky. Maybe the right time, right place type of deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. But you don't want to base your business off of being lucky. You want to base your business off of good, solid business decisions that you made because you did some sort of an analysis and that analysis pointed you toward some sort of path forward. Exactly. Now, let's say someone wants to get some help with analyzing the data. Maybe they, they're they saying, okay, I have these systems in place, but I don't know what to do with this information. What do you recommend that they do in terms of looking for someone to help them? What are they looking for? What questions should they be asking? Like, you know, what are they shopping for if they're looking for help with this? I think a great place to start, and this is mildly self-serving, would be your CFO or your mm-hmm. outsourced CFO. Just ask them like, hey, I've got this data in my business. What should I be doing with it? And if you don't have a CFO or an outsourced CFO or whatever, then maybe you go to your business coach and maybe you don't have a business coach, but you have team members like, okay, ask your team members, Hey, what are the things that you're wondering about as far as how the business is operating on a daily basis and have a question storming session session, and then just go from there. Right. So now you've kind of identified here are the questions, here are the data points that we've got. Um, And then what do you do now? If you're looking to go hire somebody, um, there's a number of ways that you can do that. Data analytics talent at this point is getting to be fairly widespread. So you can find it just about everywhere, which basically means that you can find good data analytics talent offshore. Um, You can hire those people either full-time or you can hire them part-time. I've had success doing, uh, I haven't had success doing the full-time route. I know people who have. Uh, We have had success doing some some contract slash part-time type stuff. stuff. Um, Platforms like an Upwork, those are generally good places to find part-time contract type labor where you can ask them a specific question. If you already know what tools you're going to use, I would not go down that rabbit hole if you don't really even know what tools you want to use to analyze this data or what you're really trying to get out of it. But if you have a really specific use case, we have these data points, we have we have these questions, and we know that we want to use this tool to get some sort of an output, and we're going to use that tool going forward to make these business decisions, then yeah, going down the Upwork route um, is, a, is, a, is, a good, um, is a good thing. Always ask really specific questions like, have you done work like this before? Uh, Do you have a portfolio that you can show me where you have implemented this, especially if you're looking for visualizations? Mm -hmm. Um, What is it that you find most interesting about this work? That'll really, the answers that you get to those questions are really going to tell you whether or not they truly have expertise in, in getting to what you're trying to get at. Well, yeah. And their industry experience and Mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, And like you said, the more specific, the more value you're going to get out of a platform like that. So that's really good advice. Um, So Chris, tell us a little bit about how folks can learn more from you. Where are you active online or uh, where can folks go to hear more about Better Way CPA? Yeah. Best way is betterwaycpa.com. That's the website. We've got a blog on there that um, gets updated fairly regularly and YouTube channel. If you just search Chris Overshawn on YouTube. And then I'm also on Twitter. Twitter is probably where I'm most active. Cool. All right. Well, make sure you check him out, check out his YouTube channel uh, and give him a follow. Okay. Thanks Chris again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Anytime. Thank you.